Hello and welcome to Philosophy Gets Schooled. I'm Simon Kirchin, a philosopher based at the University of Kent. We're recording this episode in September 2022. This episode is about a key topic in epistemology, namely the idea of getting knowledge of the world through perception. So we'll be thinking about perception and knowledge in general and various positions and problems, direct realism, indirect realism and Barclay's idealism. We'll also see what else we get on to as always. Joining me in this episode, we've got Michael Lacewing, teacher at Christ Hospital School. Hi, Michael. Hello, Simon. Thanks for having me. Uh, and we've got Dan McKee, who's taught philosophy at various schools and colleges and currently writes a blog called Philosophy Unleashed. Hi, Dan. Hi, Simon. Nice to be here. Uh, good to have both of you with us. OK, so we're going to talk about perception as a source of knowledge today, which is one of the most important topics in epistemology. This topic appears in the AQA specification for philosophy, but not in OCR, Edexcel, A-level specifications Um, If you're studying epistemology as part of the International Baccalaureate, then this topic will be part of what you're likely to study as well. Although it isn't mentioned in Scottish hires, awareness of the debates about perception in relation to what Descartes and Hume say will be important, or at least I I think it will. Okay, so let's start with some basic points about epistemology. What's epistemology? What do we mean by perception? And what do we mean when we say perception can be a possible source of knowledge? Uh, Michael, Dan, who wants to have a crack at those opening questions to warm us up? I mean, I'll happily just say what it what it is. You know, I mean, epistemology is the theory of knowledge. It's looking at you know what do we know and and how do we know that we know and can we know and questions of of knowing in general and what it means to use that phrase that we use all the time. I know this or I don't know that. So when it comes to perception, we're saying, well what do we know about the things that we perceive, which means, you know, experience through our senses of the world, sort of see, hear, taste, touch, etc. And it's worth remembering that, actually, because a lot of, when, when, I, when I talk about perception in class, we sort of tend towards the visual quite a lot of the time, perception as here's something that you see. But it's all of the senses, and there's lots of different things you can think about with perception based on all of them. But it's really important because if we're talking about what is it we know and can we know things and what do we know about the world, most of what we know about the world, as I've just described the senses, comes through perception. So I hear stuff, I see stuff, I smell stuff, I taste stuff. That's how I know a lot of things. And even things you hear from people making knowledge claims in books or verbally to you, well, I'm seeing that with my eyes, I'm hearing that with my ears. So actually... If we can't trust perception, if perception doesn't give us knowledge or information that is accurate and could lead to knowledge, then we've got a real problem for any kind of knowledge claim, because it's hard to see how you would get to any knowledge if we're not perceiving the world accurately. And that is a problem because, um, as we'll see in this podcast, there are many reasons you might question uh, whether we are really perceiving the world properly or not. As I tend to say to students, uh, if all goes well, I'll make you doubt that you're really sitting on the chair you're sitting on. So okay, I good. will make you doubt to all you listeners. <laughs> if you're, I mean, I mean, people have kind of started listening to this podcast thinking they're listening to the three of us, but I don't know if they really are listening to the three of us. Perhaps by the end, they'll have made a decision. Michael, anything you want to add to, to that introduction? No, I think that's uh, that's that's very good. Within the within the specification as a whole, it kind of looks at maybe there are other ways of gaining knowledge as well. But I completely agree with Dan that it's a it's a really natural place to start uh, in terms of thinking about you know if if we can't have knowledge from perception, we could be in 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 trouble in terms of thinking about knowledge at all. So one of the one of the first things we'll, we'll be getting into is is um, how does perception work? Because we want some kind of account as to what's going on in perception in order to know what it is that we could learn through it and how we could learn through it. Great. Okay. And actually, uh, Dan, it's really important for you uh, to mention, you know, all five senses, or of course, that there are some researchers who think there are more than five senses. That's that's a, perhaps a different uh, podcast. But I'm, I'm just something else that just goes through my head, just because I was talking to some students of mine yesterday about it so you might hear us uh, say the word belief a lot uh, as you're listening to the podcast so often particularly if you're starting philosophy first of all you might think by belief we mean something quite narrow like a religious belief or a or a strong political belief and of course it does that, that word as philosophers use it does encompass religious beliefs and political beliefs and, and whatever else but we're also in fact 
more typically thinking about what you might think of as everyday beliefs, such as uh, when we're recording this podcast, I can see a laptop. I believe there is a laptop in front of me. I believe I'm sitting in a chair, those sort of beliefs. So when Michael, Dan and I talk about our beliefs about straws in water, which might come up later on, that's the kind of thing we've got in mind rather than airy fairy religious or, or political beliefs. Yeah, can I just add to that that yeah, yeah. Um, obviously you'll listen to different podcasts at different times, different topics, and how this is taught in the certainly the AQA philosophy course might be different in different schools. But at some point in epistemology, you'll think about definitions of knowledge and belief is part of, of some of those definitions. And it's worth keeping in mind as we have this discussion, whatever your beliefs about the definition of knowledge are, does what your in, intuitions and things about perception and the things that we talk about today, does it meet the criteria of what you think in another part of your course or another conversation knowledge has to be and there's a sort of tension sometimes between defining knowledge and defining beliefs and then what we end up saying we do or don't know through perception and sort of seeing if the the thing is consistent throughout both topics so I always want to teach you whichever order I teach it in tell students to keep that in mind you know does your conclusions about definition hold when we practically apply it to perception Great. And that's a nice that nice way to ad- advertise uh, our episode on the tripartite theory of knowledge uh, as, a, as an introduction. Not that I've recorded it yet. I'm recording it in about two weeks' time. So, But most of the times you listen to this, it will be up on the page. Okay, great. So let's um, then think about one of the first main positions or stances that says we can have, or hopes perhaps, that we can have knowledge um, from perception or that we can have perceptual knowledge and that's direct realism. So who wants to have a crack at explaining that first of all? Michael? I can I can pick that one up. So direct realism wants to take, uh, defend what you might think of as a common sense point of view, certainly a starting point of view. It gets more complicated, as we'll see in time, but it starts off very simply. What you need for perception is a physical object. We're restricting ourselves to kind of perceptions of physical objects. And you can include your own body in that. But normally we're talking about perception of other other objects and the person doing the perceiving. And that's kind of it. Um, so perception is just a relationship you know, mediated by the sense organs, which you've already mentioned, between the person and the thing which is being perceived. So the, the direct realist, the kind of two parts there, the realism bit is the view that there are physical objects which exist independent of our perception of them. And of course, that's also common sense or the scientific approach as well. You might well say, well, look, human beings are kind of late on the scene. Indeed, animals that perceive are kind of late on the scene in terms of evolutionary history. There was a time when there were just stars and planets and you know, maybe there were rocks and then we got bacteria. And at some point or other, some being was able to perceive its environment in some kind of a way. But the environment was already there. It, it exists first, and it exists independent of perception. So that's realism, is the claim that there are mind-independent physical objects. And that's a, a contrast to the theory we'll look at last with idealism, which is very counterintuitive to many people, which suggests there are no things which exist independent of being perceived, or the perceiver themselves. So realism is the common sense kind of view. Of course, there's a physical world out there, and that's what we see. The direct bit of direct realism says and that that what you perceive in a a rough way is is roughly what's there. So you perceive physical objects, and you perceive their properties. So this is going to get a little bit more complicated. But importantly, there's no no intermediary um, between the perceiver and the world. It's it's a kind of idea that you, you can look as we think with vision, you can look onto the world and there yeah, there is the world and you perceive the world and the properties that physical objects have. Great. That was really uh, clear, Michael. Dan, anything to add to that before we move on to some problems? Well, no, I mean, I just think when we move on to the problems to keep in mind, as, as Michael said, it is this sort of common sense position. And most of us would say we are direct realists where, before we think about it. I think it was Hume who says, you know, it before you do the slightest bit of philosophy, you, you are it. But it, once you do the slightest bit of philosophy, then you realise sort of it, it doesn't work. But at the same time, this is the position that we we tend to have because it works. You know, we we get born and we see something, and the thing that we see is is there. And you know, if I want to pick up the water to drink, I go to where I see the water and I pick it up, and it goes to my mouth, and I can feel the water and taste the water, and that's kept me alive. 
So there's like a great success to a world where you believe what you see. The the idea of the phenomenal principle that, you know, if I see a blue book, it's because it's blue. And that's how, you know, if I want to publish a blue book, I tell the publisher I want blue and they know what I mean. And they tell the printer this color and the color that we chose, it's all the same. And it comes out and in every shot. We all see the same blue. And it feels like that is the way the world is. And that's the way we perceive the world. And so it's a common sense view, but it's not just sort of like a, a common sense view that we just happen to have. And then when we think about it, we'll realize how stupid it is because there are questions that will come when we ask about it. But it does work and it does seem to be the basis on what most of our understanding of the world that we are living in uh, is based on this sort of assumption of diet realism. So sometimes students struggle with defending it. You know, if you you have to write an essay talking about criticisms, we're going to now go into a lot of criticisms. And so I think it's always worth just reminding people that um, for all the criticisms that we're going to look at, why do why does this view persist? Why do people instinctively hold it? And it's because it, before you think too deeply about it, it does seem pretty like the way the world is. You know, yeah. why else do I have all these sense organs, etc.? Yeah, that's an important reminder. I think so. We're about to kind of kick it a lot, but in fact, it keeps on coming back, and there's a reason why it's a common sense view. Okay, so it's a common sense view. We all hold it, and then clever clogs, irritating philosophers come along and start going, "Ah, but have you thought about this?" And "Ah, but have you thought about that?" Um, so should we pick up on there's, there's like four that I think we can probably cover illusion perceptual variation hallucination and time lag uh, I've got here on my on my crib sheet should we go for illusion first because that's probably kind of an easy one to explain anyone want to have a go at that well illusion is um, we, have, we, we know that illusions happen we, we see uh, sticks that look bent but they are straight we no, it's illusion happens so much that magicians can make an entire living out of guaranteeing an illusion for an audience every night at the same time in the same way, because they understand that our senses don't actually always show us what the world is. Sometimes what, what we see comes apart from what really is. And you can look one way and see something and think you're seeing something when you're not. Maybe mirrors are involved, maybe smoke is involved, maybe just misdirection and you look at the wrong thing at the wrong time. So there's this argument that, well, if diet realism is true, what I see is what there is. We also have this other thing, illusion, which comes along and says, well, no, because sometimes what you see is not what there is. Sometimes what you see is very specifically not what there is. So therefore, does that happen all the time? You know, how do you know when you're having what we normally call veridical perception, perception of what is actually the case versus an illusion of something. And, you know, there's a million illusions we can think of from optical illusions to mirages to all these things that we know, you know, there's auditory illusions where you you think you hear something coming from the room next door, but it's actually coming from somewhere else, it's bouncing off the wall in the wrong way. So it gives you a sort of misplaced sense of direction. All of these ways of of thinking you 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 see it but but you don't and if that is the case does that mean our entire understanding of perception comes apart it shows a possibility that the thing i think i'm seeing now might be an illusion maybe a magician is going to come along and tell me ah this was all a trick there's not really a laptop in front of you or as a big internet meme um has shown us maybe it's a cake i think it's a real laptop and someone's going to put a knife through it and it turns out it's a cake all along so you know th- there's all kinds of illusions and that is a, a worry if you're going to have that sort of principle that what there is is what i perceive yeah great uh michael anything to add to to that i would I'd, yeah develop the idea of of that that difference between what there is and and what we perceive there to be in terms of the, the, the ideas of appearance and reality. And so it looks like illusions are really nice examples, as Dan has kind of explained, where there could be an appearance which is not the reality. So as soon as you kind of use that word, you say, well, of course, I, I see how things appear to be. You know, what else could I see when I look at a tree or I look at a, a straw in water, as you mentioned that kind of earlier, or the, the, the crooked stick. So if you if people don't know this, if you immerse a, a straight physical object, such as a stick or a pencil or a, a straw in water, then just as it passes through the water, it apparently has a has a bend in it, at least from certain angles. And you say, well, okay, I'm, I'm looking at the world. And of course, what I perceive is is how it appears to me. And that is then immediately a problem for the direct realist because the direct realist said, well, you see the world and they meant reality. And now they kind of have to go, well, no, I suppose I, I see how reality appears. 
And that's kind of, whoa, 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 whoa. So is, is it a little bit more complicated now? If you've got <laughs> appearance and reality and perception is not of reality, but of appearances. And that's what the argument from illusion is, is, um, is kind of suggesting to us. In fact, you get the same, the same kind of conclusion from the, from the second objection. Uh, and I think it's kind of helpful to sort of put them side by side in that, which is that uh, it's called from perceptual variation. And the variation here is between different people or perhaps between the, the same person on different occasions can look at one and the same physical object. And they will see it at least subtly differently. It can be massively differently. I'll give you an example of that, which actually a student gave me today. Um, but it's often subtly differently. So if two people are, are looking at a, a table from different angles, one from one side, one from the other side, if you were in an art class and you were told to draw that table, and let's suppose the table is a, is a rectangle, it's not actually going to be accurate to draw what you see. If you draw a rectangle, you have to kind of draw it as a trapezoid, and you have to capture the perspective when you're painting something. You have to capture the perspective from which somebody sees something. So the point is that the table presumably only has one shape, if you like, in and of itself. But if two people look at that table and they're accurate in drawing what they see, they will see different shapes. So this, again, raises a challenge to the direct realist. Namely, you said we could see the table, a physical object, and its properties. Well, amongst its properties is its shape. It turns out no one sees the table as a rectangle unless they're sort of dangling above it from a wire or something like that. People will see it as different shapes. So again, this is the idea that what you see is not the physical object itself, but an appearance of it. And so we've again inserted that. The, the example that the student gave me was the, the famous dress on the internet, which was viewed as black and blue by some people and white and gold by other people. Now, it's very rare for our sense perception of one and the same physical object well, this was, of course, a photo of it, to be that different. But it did kind of show that people could see the same physical object as radically different colors. But there's only one photo there. There's only one dress. Um, and that's a real example that we must be seeing the appearance rather than the, than the dress or the table or, or the straw itself. In some yeah, way. Great. And in fact, that, in fact, I was going to mention that example of the dress as well. So obviously your student and I are in the, on the same wavelength. And in fact, just to go back to um, for this to help the students. So in the early comments, in, introducing everything, Michael, you said the point about direct realism is that word direct. There's no intermediary. And what we're doing with both of these illusion and perceptual variation is going, aha, there's something that seems as if it's an intermediary. Right. There's appearance. It's not directly accessing reality. What we're directly ac accessing is the appearance we assume of reality. And that's that's where these two um, objections are coming from. Right? And of course, the thought is that people are getting different appearances, right? In the dress case, in the straw case, in lots of oral cases. Well, oh yeah, then I, there's the McGurk effect because I I, I yeah. use that for illusion more than perceptual variation, but it, it is the same. And in fact, I I would say, as Michael said, perceptual variation. Um, an illusion kind of are, are saying the same thing as a criticism. They're just pointing at different examples. And I tend to say that they are, you know, illusion is a perceptual variation in a way, because it's, it's, it's a, if you were closer to the mirage than the person who sees the mirage, you see it's not there. And, you know, it's a variation. That's, that's how magicians think about sight lines and things like that. But um, the McGurk effect is this, this audio one. I, I've heard it with bar and far, where apparently if you, he, you, it's always you say the same word like i think it's bar or far i can't remember which is the correct word that you say but if you see a video of someone's mouth saying the fuh instead of the ba, it changes what you hear even though the sound never changes and if you close your eyes you will you will hear the correct uh sound but if you see this it misleads you to the point that you can't uh, you, you can't undo it so even if you know it's an illusion and you know that this is what's happening um, it will still work on you forever because that's your brain just sort of fills in these these gaps. So it's a variation in perception because if you see a different mouth, you will hear something different. But it's also an illusion because they've made you see one mouth and hear a different sound. And I would say that the, the, the third criticism, the time lag argument, is also a form of perceptual variation because it's based again on sort of the perceptual variation of distance in this case. You know, if you are uh, millions of miles away from something, uh, you see something that you think is happening now, say a, a star 
uh, in space, but you're not really seeing it now. If you were really now, you're seeing something from the past that's sort of taking some time to get to your eyes. Um, and you hear it at concerts as well. You know, if you're in a big field listening at a festival to a band and you watch them hit the kick drum, it takes a while before the sound gets to you and you see it. You even get it like football matches across a stadium. You might see people clapping over on one side and it doesn't quite line up with the sound. So it's a time lag. You, you get the sense delayed from what is actually happening. You're not really perceiving now. You're perceiving the past. But if you were closer, you would be perceiving now. So that's why I'd say it's also a form of perceptual variation. And in a way, those three criticisms are all saying, as Michael says, the same thing, that there is this appearance and reality distinction occurring where you, what is appearing to you and what you're perceiving does not seem to map on to reality, whether it's reality of like time, right now this is not happening anymore, or space, like where you're stood, where you're seeing a particular object, what is its true shape and stuff like that, or you know, an illusion where you can explain the story as to why it sounded like something happened over there where you think you saw something, but if you were from a different vantage point, you would perceive it differently. So they're all forms of perceptual variation. Uh, Michael, anything to add to that before we see if we can rescue direct realism? I can I can try and rescue direct realism. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm happy to I'm happy to give that a go. As you say, it keeps it keeps coming up. And the the person I suppose that or the, the yeah the, the philosopher who who I think has has done the most and recently, well, it's a little while ago now, to, to hold on to this was John McDowell. He wanted to say, well, let's let's think about what we're what we're kind of saying is involved. He wasn't the only one by any means, but he he kind of presented some of the main kind of ideas that we that we still use. So there there are two things I suppose I would want to say. Um, the first, perhaps more particularly with illusion and perceptual variation, is to say, okay, okay, as a direct realist. You're right that when I'm perceiving what's going on, I can't say that the you know the stick in water is actually bent, or that you know in the mirage there's really is water in the desert. So clearly, I I can't I can't say that. So there is a difference between I'll stay with the stick because it's it's a nice one to kind of do a contrast on. It is you can you can kind of say well the way the world is is that the stick is straight. It's just immersed in water, but it appears to be bent. So what we could do, though, as a direct realist is understand appearances as properties that objects have under certain perceptual conditions or to certain perceivers. And so if you do this, you say, well, look, I I don't want to say that, say the stick is crooked, but it does look crooked. So what I'm going to say, I'm going to introduce the notion of a relational property here. Now, relational properties are very common. We, We often talk about things in comparison to each other. So Ben is taller than, well, kind of whether that's true or false depends on the word that comes next, right? Ben is taller than Bill, but Ben is not taller than Sandy, say. Okay, so you get this, this, this idea that we, well, but, but who, whose height is at stake here? Well, Ben, <laughs> but Ben only has that kind of height property of taller than in comparison to something else. So similarly, I can talk about the stick's shape and i can talk about the shape of the stick in 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 a sense in and of itself it is straight but i can talk about the shape of the stick in relation to being perceived in its current circumstances and it's half submerged in water and we're talking about a human visual system it has the property of looking crooked now you might say well what do you mean the property of looking crooked how can you have a property of looking a certain way and really in terms of the the, the metaphysics of this in terms of talking about sticks um, we can say, well, this is no more problematic than saying Ben has the property of being taller than and then needing a comparator. So similarly, I can just say I, I am seeing the direct realist wants to say in the case of illusion and in the case of perceptual variation, you're still seeing the physical object and its properties. But here's the important kind of development that some of the properties that you see are the properties that are just about how it looks. And some of the properties that you see and when conditions are normal, those properties of how it looks are the same as the properties the way that it is. Mostly, sticks look straight. Well, straight sticks look straight. Pencils look straight. (laughs) Okay, So they look straight, but they also are straight. And that's why, as Dan said right at the beginning, this, this theory really works, right? The world really is one which we engage with on the basis that the way it is is the way that it looks to us. Now, in cases of appearance or variation, we can talk about the different ways that it appears. 
So I think this is a really important development of the theory and the kind of defense of the theory that the direct realist doesn't say at the end, the developed direct realist, when they've done a little bit of thinking, doesn't say at the end, the world is exactly as I perceive it to be. Nobody actually put that down in print as a philosopher and said, that's my theory. They always say, right, so there is the way the world is and what I perceive is the world. But in that perceiving of the world, there's an interaction that doesn't create any medium. Appearances aren't things, importantly. There's nothing that comes between me or that exists apart from me and the physical object. But the physical object does have some properties which are perceptually related. So they're relational properties. So and the looks properties, but oh, you can also have sounds property and it sounds like this or it tastes like this. You can kind of go in that direction. So that's how a direct realist, I think that's one of the ways in which a direct realist can try and deal with the notion of, oh, you've got an appearance reality distinction. You can say, well, yeah, but how things appear and how things really are, those are all properties of physical objects. So still, all that exists is me, the physical object, and I perceive the physical object directly. Yeah. Time lag's a bit trickier. <laughs> Yeah, good. So, shall I, shall I just go say, just underline what you just said, then, Michael? We come back to to time lag. So, yeah. So, when I interrupted a, a little while ago, and I said, "So, students, the the problem we've got with those uh, first few arguments is we've introduced an intermediary, right? We've got us, appearance, and reality." But I, but I deliberately didn't say because um, I knew you were contradicting, Michael, that the appearance is a thing, right? So now, actually, what we've got is Michael saying, look, we've still got things that exist and we've got people and they've got the things that they are and the appearances. But we're not saying the appearances are a second intermediary thing in between us and the things as they are. Right. Something else is going on. There's a different shift here. There's the things as they are and they have all sorts of properties. Some of them are appearance properties. Right. Right. So come on. Should we go to time lag then, Michael? Why is it harder? Well, I, well, harder, I suppose it depends. If you Harder to swallow for some people. So I think well, the way that Dan actually put time, time lag is something which the direct realist would just go, yep. And that is that I see the past. And that feels what, that, that seems very weird. But when we think about it, the direct realist will say, it's not that weird. When I see a, a star exploding, which exploded millions of years ago, precisely the way that astronomers present that to us is, we are now seeing the star exploding when it exploded, you know, millions of years ago. And if you go, how can you see a star that hasn't existed for millions of years? The astronomer says, well, it takes time for light to get here and so on. Now, without going into the relativity of space and time, let's not, please. Then we can still say, so all that this means is because perception is a process, it can take time. And in particular, it can take time within the physical world for information to reach our senses from the physical object. But we still directly perceive the past. And you go, well, that's just ridiculous. You know, how can you directly perceive the past? Well, because, says the direct realist, the direct bit refers to the relationship between the object and the perceiver. Didn't bring time into it. I don't have to be perceiving the now. The perception doesn't have to exist at the same time as the physical object. It's just that there's no intermediary. And if you say, well, there has to be an intermediary, namely the star doesn't exist, so you're not seeing the star, you're seeing the light from the star. That would be a mistake, says the direct realist, because you're always seeing the light from something. I look at my computer right in front of me, I'm seeing the light from the computer in a sense. But of course, I'm not, I'm seeing the computer by means of light. And so I'm not actually seeing the light um, from the computer. That would be, we'd use that phrase in English rather differently. Like you, you see the light glinting off the diamonds. It's a bit different. You know, if you see the light just reflected normally from a computer, then you just see the computer. So you don't see the light. You see the thing which the light enables you to see. And that's still true with the star. You see the star. You don't see the light. Okay, it's a light emitting source. So perhaps that's a really bad example. I just realized. So you see the you see them hit the kick, <laughs> the kick base in the concert, <laughs> right? Do you see the light from it? Well, of course you do, but not the light in that sense. You see the drum itself, all right? And, and but by means of the light. So the directness is that there is nothing that you see which enables you to see the physical object. So you see by means of light, but that's not the same. Seeing light and seeing physical objects are not exclusive. You don't see the light instead of the physical object. Um, it's just that the light reflecting from the physical object is the means by which you see 
the physical object, but you still see the physical object itself directly, just in the past. So you literally see the past or hear the past or smell, smell the past. I don't know. Probably not. That might be a little quicker. Yeah. <laughs> My mind's worrying now about smelling the past. We're Go drifting on, the breeze from somewhere else, I guess, yeah, to where yeah, you are. So if there was yeah, a fire yeah. over yeah. there, I yeah. might smell it an hour later when it gets to my house but um yeah i point. think that the complicated defense that you just did michael shows that th there is this problem because i think the direct realist can cope with this to an extent i mean i li like i said earlier if you if you condense them all and say they're all forms of perceptual variation or illusion one available uh, approach is also the relational properties approach again to say well that's when you are in relation to being x amount of miles away from a particular source of perception that's what will happen you'll see the past if you were close to it you'll see the future that's that's the way again you see it but when you start explaining the process like you did michael what what you start doing is trying to get this very fine distinction saying oh yeah because you're seeing the light not the thing and it's not a it's not an intermediary it's something else and i think what happens there is we start to see why this is a bigger problem for direct realists and maybe when we we start talking about indirect realism how you might be able to explain that a bit better and in a way critics would say of direct realism that's where they start to see the, the cracks because to try and explain this in a way where you're definitely saying i'm directly seeing the thing it just happens to be the past because i'm seeing the light but i'm not just seeing the light i'm seeing the object the light's just the means like it feels like you're sort of you just acknowledge when you said i I, the lights the means that that phrase for the direct realist could be like well, what do you mean by the means that sounds like a mediation so i think that's that's sort of exposing that problem that we're going to be uh looking at later when we look at indirect realism certainly okay so let's just bring you back to some of the other problems for direct realism so we've done a lot about uh perceptual variation illusion time lag uh we've just been talking a lot about time uh there's one we haven't talked about directly and that's hallucination so someone want to explain the hallucination problem for direct realism for us well when i was saying earlier that perceptual variation could be the way you describe all illusion time lag and perceptual variation it was because what we were seeing was this distinction between how the world really is and, and how it's appearing and we can sort of solve that by saying well the world is a bit more complicated but you can still directly perceive what's going on in some way but there's this other thing which we all know happens, which is hallucination, which is when you literally perceive things that aren't there. So you can, again, have hallucinations visually. You can have um, sound hallucinations, taste hallucinations, and you you are perceiving what is not there. I mean, we've had COVID-19 for a few years now. Uh, people have experienced um, smells that aren't there as one of the, the symptoms of, of COVID-19 or taste things that aren't there as part of it. I, I myself have had that as well as part of uh, when I had COVID and you've had fevers where you might see people running around who don't exist, you know, whatever. And the problem here is we are definitely perceiving all this stuff happening with all the same senses. It seems uh, that we've just been saying is how I directly see the world and mediate it. Only now that, that you're not seeing the world and we can't say, Oh, it's a re relational property because nothing's causing it. The call is coming from inside the house. Your, your brain is creating it, your mind, whatever you want to say your body and what that really does and i'm sure we'll talk about ways you could maybe solve that from a direct realist point of view but importantly what it does is it shows that the mind has the potential to create the world so whatever story direct realist might tell you in a minute to say this is why we think this is okay i think it's important to keep in the back of your mind even if that does explain it in some way it shows there's this capability our bodies have of producing i think the phrase in the aqa spec is is, is so experiences that are subjectively indistinguishable from veridical perception so whether i am really talking to you guys on the podcast right now or i'm hallucinating the whole conversation um to me it doesn't feel any different you know this is this would be exactly the same now in one world um i'm really talking to you in another one i'm having a hallucination now even if we can say it some way well that's a hallucination and that's something different from perception we know that people hallucinate and that's quite worrying because if I can hallucinate in some situations, maybe I'm hallucinating all the time. Maybe everything I perceive is created internally. Maybe there is no, back to the realism thing, maybe there is no external world. How do I know? So whereas perceptual variation kind of describes some interesting relationships we might have with that world, hallucination 
really opens up the possibility that we have the capability of producing a world completely uh, out of our own minds that isn't really there. Yeah, I have to say, Dan, though, if you're hallucinating this conversation, you have some very boring hallucinations. Michael, any thoughts from you? I'm going to carry on defending direct realism here. And then it would be nice when, when we move to the next one, maybe we'll swap around and, and um, I don't know if Dan's going to defend indirect realism or Barclay, but I can have a go. Um, and we'll see how that goes. It, was, it creates nice. So yes, absolutely. I think what we can say is that we've got two parts to the, to the answer from the direct realist. And again, I'm partly kind of going with, with what in ideas in, originally introduced by John McDowell here. So what we can say when, when Dan says, well, you're d- definitely, perceiving something in these hallucinations, uh, the direct realist would say, no, you're not. I agree, perhaps it, it seems like you are perceiving something, but precisely the word perceiving is, 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 is the wrong one to use here because you're imagining it. We have to say when in a hallucination, you are imagining it. So what is it more accurate to say that you're imagining it or that you're perceiving it? And intuitively to me anyway, it feels like I want to say, well, actually, no, I'm not perceiving it. It's not there. I'm imagining it. So what the what the direct realist will say, because of course they can't use the relational properties argument. You can't sort of look at, uh, you know, hallucinate a pink elephant in the corner of the room and go, the corner of the room looks like a pink elephant. That's just, you know, that's just bizarre. There's, you can't do that. It doesn't have those relational properties to anyone. This is, as Dan said, all inside your head. So, but precisely because it's all inside your head, you can say, well, this isn't perception at all. So there's imagination and there's perception. And it's true that we can sometimes confuse one for another. You can imagine a smell and you think you're perceiving a smell. Nevertheless, they're two very different things. So there are appearances, if you like, that occur in imagination. But the direct reader says that doesn't tell us anything about how perception works because perception is just a completely different process. Um, it's just one that we can sometimes mistake hallucination for. Now you can go, well, yeah, but why do we make the mistake if they're completely different? And that's where the direct reader says, well, yeah, this is just what happens, <laughs> right? You, we can, there's no guarantee that you know that you're perceiving when you're perceiving or that you know that you're hallucinating when you're hallucinating, more particularly the second. And but never, this is called the disjunctive theory. Either you're perceiving or you're hallucinating. My theory is about what's going on when you're perceiving. The fact that you can be mistaken about hallucinating doesn't tell me anything about what's going on when you're perceiving. And I only have to defend that theory. That's the first part. If the second part is, well, then how do you know? We've got two options. The first is the director who says, I don't have to answer that. See theories of knowledge. <laughs> um, and a reference to the other podcast. OK, that's the first one. Um, and so if anybody is listening or has listened to them, don't listen to them at the same time, but one in sequence, the direct realist is probably going to be a reliabilist. OK, so just going to put that one out there and drop it. The other thing is, if you think the direct realist can't solve the problem of how do you know that what you're perceiving is real? Wait till you hear what the other two theories have to say. And it wins just by comparison. <laughs> but that's to anticipate what comes next. OK, thanks, Michael. Listen, why don't we leave it there? Because that was a really good explanation and a a to and fro. And we might come back at the end to compare all three theories. But let's leave direct realism there. And we'll see you in the next part when we talk about indirect realism. And welcome back. Before we move into this segment, this is just to give you my regular reminder uh, to check out our website. Uh, So if you just search for Simon Kirchin, uh, you'll find my personal website. And if you click on one of the tabs at the top, which says Pod Schools, you'll see a link to all of the uh, episodes and also a list uh, of a timetable of all the episodes we're recording. Have a look on there. And if you see an episode that's coming up and you want to ask us some questions about it, feel free to drop me an email at s.t.curchin at kent.ac.uk. Or if you see an episode that's already been recorded, you've listened to it, you've got some questions about it, feel free to email me as well. I am sure uh, once we've been through quite a few topics, we'll have a few Q&As with some people. We'll be firing questions at them. I'm sure Dan and Michael would love to answer questions about hallucinations and all the rest. Okay, so we've introduced uh, perception and epistemology and thought about one of the big stances, namely direct realism. 
And a few times we've mentioned its sibling, indirect realism. So who wants to have a crack at starting to explain that before we tear that one apart as well? Well, shall I start to explain it because Michael uh, <laughs> wants to tear it down? And yeah, go on, have a go. So, um, we'll see if I can defend it. Um, I, I never quite know with any of these theories of perception what I believe, and every time I teach it, I sort of end up changing my mind, <laughs> depending, I guess, on the, the contributions of the students that make me think. But essentially, we've got this idea, we perceive the world directly, you know, we like this idea of realism. Realism sounds nice because it tells me that there is a world I'm interacting in, I'm not just sitting in some you know, empty void somewhere imagining the whole thing. And I've said already that direct realism has this great benefit of being the thing that seems to allow us to function in the world and survive. So the realism part is really nice. The idea that there is this mind independent world. I like, as I talk to you two, believing that you are real, actual people in the world and not just something I've, I've created. But we've got all these problems with the idea of directness. And, and as I said to Michael, when he was sort of talking about time lag, there's this problem when you start trying to go into relational condition uh, p- properties and different conditions would, would change your perception when you try and commit to that idea of it being direct that i'm seeing it directly and there's nothing mediating it and all indirect realism says is but would it maybe be a more obvious answer a, a more simple answer uh, to say there is a mind independent world out there but this obvious appearance reality distinction that is happening can be explained by saying we don't perceive it directly Instead, we perceive it indirectly, mediated through something else. So it's usually called something like sense data, right? So I don't see the the world directly. I don't see my laptop. I see light coming from the laptop, which which puts information to my eyes in this case and tells my brain some stuff. And then what I'm actually doing is I'm seeing a projection of this laptop inside my brain. I mean, as I'm talking, I'm just thinking this is essentially what science tells us is how we perceive so the theory so previously that the direct realist idea and we sort of not talked about how the sense organs actually work as far as we know so when i'm hearing the kick drum we know that there are sound waves that are coming to to my ear and if i've got an ear um, they are picking them up properly and if there's something wrong with my ear i won't pick them up properly or they might be distorted if i've got wax in my ear that messes up the perception of that sound wave same with you know the the light and my laptop and if the light's working, I can see it. If I'm in the dark and the light's broken on my laptop, I maybe won't see it. So it seems that actually this idea that maybe we don't see things directly, but we we see something that the thing in reality gives off that then we process in some way and perceive because it makes us process it indirectly. We have contact with reality, but it's mediated through this thing. So whether my eyes work well, whether my, my ears work well, whether there's the, the right conditions to give me the right thing, whether I'm receiving accurate sense data or not, basically. And then that can explain things like perceptual variation, because if I receive the information from the table from this angle or that angle, I'm going to obviously process it differently and perceive it differently. And that doesn't mean there's not a table there. And that doesn't mean we're all seeing the same table, but it just means we're indirectly sort of making a representation of that reality in our heads again, as opposed to directly seeing it in the world so we get to keep the the realism bit but we are now comfortable with the fact that we're not seeing it directly and it explains illusion it explains time lag it explains perceptual variation in a kind of you know occam's razor what's the simplest explanation that i'm directly seeing it but in these ways that don't quite make sense or just that i'm never directly seeing it i'm always just receiving information that i'm processing and you know creating a perception of the world as it were an appearance of the world that is how the world is but it's not directly seeing it so there is a world it causes my perception but the perception i have is not necessarily of the world as it is but it is as the world is is mediated through the way i perceive great okay michael any initial thoughts before we move on to some just just one thought perhaps on that on the sense data um dan's emphasized there really helpfully all the ways in which the sense data can be formed or influenced um, to to create different appearances. For for many philosophers, they they refer to the sense data as the the final product, if you like, of all of that. It's not to confuse data and information. The information comes and the sense data would be the final appearance, which 
many of them sort of treat as a mental thing. It may well be something, depending on your view of the relationship between mind and brain, be something in the brain or created by the brain, but it would be the mental, the mental thing. So you've got the mental representation, as you said, um, the mental. And so the notion of the appearance there is that, you know, then you, you can kind of start to explain, well, it appears this way because that's in the mind, but it is this way. Well, that's out in the, in the physical world. And so, yeah, exactly, exactly that sense data looks like it can explain what's going on in illusion um, and, and all the things that Dan said. I just emphasize that it's the, it's, it's the kind of final mental product, which many people refer to as, as the sense data itself. Great. Okay, so let's move on then and let's think uh, about a few people. And the first person we need to think about is uh, John Locke and his distinction between primary and secondary qualities and perhaps one thing to emphasize to all the students so we we could just be doing the philosophy here but it's we're not going to say perhaps too much or at least i'm not going to but it's very important to realize that in the background that a lot of these big epistemic questions these big stances were developed you know a few centuries ago you know in early modern western european times alongside the rise of modern science and there was a really interesting interaction between philosophical thought and scientific development. And indeed, many of the people we're talking about weren't, as it were, labelled philosophers at universities in a nice, you know, philosophy academic job. They were just interested people who would go between lots of different areas and thinking about them all. Um, I mean, not everyone who works in epistemology is dead. So Michael's mentioned John McDowell. John McDowell is is a very influential modern philosopher. But some of the people that you see on the on the specification are some of these big beasts in early modern uh, Western philosophy. Um, so let's then think about John Locke and the distinction between primary and secondary qualities, because that's a key part of this of this story. Um, who wants to talk about primary and secondary qualities? I'm I'm happy to pick that up. So. We can add this as a yet another argument supporting indirect realism if it didn't already seem attractive in the way in which it, it manages to explain perceptual variation and illusion and so on. We can say, well, let's make the distinction then between appearance and reality and think about what's going on there. And as you said, Simon, at the time that Locke was writing, the you know, science was was really kind of picking up and the development of it. And it, we were kind of thinking, well, what would what what's the object itself kind of really like? And what is it that, in a sense, is just being added in the mind or is part of the process? In fact, there's some issues around the interpretation of Locke. I'm just going to put, for reasons of time and simplicity, I think it's best probably just to put those to one side. But suppose, (laughs) we could put it this way, certainly it's much clearer in, in Hume's version, but it's Locke's version we look at on the spec, that we can talk about what makes the physical object the kind of thing that it is. So what do physicists tell us? After all, it's a physical object, so let's go to physics. Well, it has certain measurable qualities, such as its size, its shape. We can count the table. We can weigh the table. So we can talk about that. We can measure its, its heat in the sense of the Kelvin measurement of it, put a thermometer next to it, and so on. So we can, we can look at a number of these. Um, ideas and say, well, that's what the table is like. But when it comes to things like the color of the table, that turns out to be rather complicated. Um, the color of the table we now know is mediated by light, which is picked up in our eyes. And the, way, the color is related in a very complicated way to wavelengths of light which are reflected. But it's very complicated such that exactly the same wavelengths of light can appear to be different colors depending on all kinds of things about our perceptual system. Take a, I don't know, a black and blue dress that appears to be white and gold. Oh my goodness. So it was just one set of you know, wavelengths that were being reflected by that particular garment, but it can be seen as, perceived as these very different colors. And you can see all sorts of color illusions you know, on YouTube and so on. So what's really going on? Well, when you look at our perceptual system, it's very sensitive to some wavelengths. It's set up in various ways. And and they were discovering that different perceptual systems see different colors. So pigeons just have more pink in their color. Um, If you put on rose-tinted spectacles, a bit more like a pigeon. Um, because they have a fourth cone. They have a fourth type of cone in their eyes, which is a color-receiving cell. and, And we know that insects see in ultraviolet. So what is the color of a table? And you can't, there's no one way of fixing it. The way that you can fix the size of it, you get your meter rule out and so on. What's the actual color of the table? Well, that seems entirely dependent on the perceptual system. 
I can tell you what the wavelengths of light are that are being reflected by getting a spectrometer and just holding it over it. But that doesn't tell you the color, which depends on how you're perceiving it. So the color, the taste, the smell, the sound something makes. We know dogs can hear things which, you know, we can't, that young children can hear things that old people can't, that, and so on. So these, these seem to be properties which we sometimes attribute to or often attribute to physical objects, but which don't seem to be part of the object in itself, but just part of our perception of it. So the distinction that, that Locke draw, he called them primary and secondary qualities. So primary qualities are the ones that I've been saying are part of the physical object. And he kind of backed this up and said, well, every physical object is going to have it. You can't have a physical object that doesn't have a size at all or doesn't have a shape at all or, you know, you can't count them, something like that. These are, these are essential properties of any physical object. And that kind of characterizes what it is to be a physical object. Secondary qualities, on the other hand, seem to be dependent upon particular perceptual systems. We can't fix any one of those onto the object itself to say, it is that color. We could say, well, it is that color to humans under certain lights. So that's the best we can do. How we see the table, I see the table as brown just as much as I see it as rectangular. But what it actually is, is rectangular. And the brownness is part of the sense data. Aha. <laughs> so we have to get sense data in on the picture to say the, the object that we see, the appearance, is a combination of something which is purely mental, color, smell, sound. And the physical cause of that, wavelengths of light or with smell, particular chemicals or so on. And that again gets this appearance reality distinction a lot of, a lot of importance. The, the, the properties the object has in and of itself, the properties I appear it, to, it appears to have to me, really show me that there is this distinction between my perception and the world. Great. That was really helpful, Michael. Dan, anything to add before we move on? Well, no, I'm, all I'd say to add to it is I think what, what's useful with Locke is, is Locke does also give us this further evidence to say there's the appearance reality distinction and, and here's how he's going to explain it. But it also um, answers a part of a question that, that will arise. Michael said earlier, you know, one of the arguments a direct realist might make is wait until you see what the other attempts of explaining the world are. And a, a big problem, you might say, with indirect realism is if it is indirect um, and I don't see reality directly, how do I know what I'm perceiving has any bearing on reality? You know, I could just be seeing it all in my head. So like I said, we, we, we have an object that gives us some sort of information but maybe the sense data I produce is completely unlike the reality at all. So I'm sitting in front of my laptop, maybe a real laptop is 7,000 feet wide. <laughs> and to me, it is this tiny thing on my desk. But my mind just receives this information and creates this ratio scale world of things that is completely different than the, the real world. But what Locke's distinction allows us to do is say, well, there are some things that it feels like we do know what reality is, that we can say that you are actually not directly perceiving still because, you know, you are having it mediated. But the thing that you are perceiving does have some information about the the actual world that allows you to kind of know some stuff about the world. So remember we said at the start, this is epistemology. And the big sort of question about all of this is, is what do I know about reality as I perceive reality? So what primary qualities allow us to do is say there are some things you can know. So I don't know what colour the real bee is as it flies around my garden, um, but I do know that there is this object in space in that position moving around and there's one of them and not two of them because um, that stuff is a primary quality. And there is me in the world, there in the world, we're sharing the same you know, time and space together. And that's some information which is quite useful, even if it turns out they're not yellow and black like I thought they were. There's something completely different. Okay, great. So, Dan, you mentioned uh, as you started speaking about a main problem here about scepticism. So should we just underline that problem then about scepticism about the external world? Yeah, I mean, I, I started by saying we don't know what the, the, if the, the world that I'm seeing is exactly like the real world actually is. But it goes a bit further than that. I mean, you've got that as a definite problem. Um, the way I tend to talk to students about it is if I never actually see the world, I only see an indirect version of the world that is created by me based on the information. I can never check whether the information that I have created matches onto that reality. So the way I say it is if, if I showed them a painting that I've done and said, isn't this a brilliant painting of this guy? 
And if they haven't seen the person the painting is of, they can't tell me whether it's a brilliant painting of the guy. They can't tell me whether it's an accurate representation of this person at all. I might have drawn someone who looks completely not like the person I say it is at all. You can't check. So we've got this question of, is the thing that I'm perceiving actually anything like the reality? But I'd like to say it goes worse than that because you can then start saying, well, hang on. If all I'm seeing is perception and there's what we call this veil of perception, everything I see is this mediated thing that I never can get beyond my own perceptions of it. How do I actually know that there is a real world causing that stuff and that it's not all hallucination or just self-created? Because again, if I was imagining a bee or I created a bee, I can tell myself that their primary qualities that are just like the real object would have. But I can never see the real object and go, oh, yeah, that's what a bit, that's the size of a bee. That's the motion of a bee. Because I can't ever get there. I can't ever get outside of my perceptions to confirm it. So, what you have is this information that you are positing is coming from somewhere, but is not coming necessarily from somewhere you can ever check that it's coming from that place. And if you can't check it, maybe it's not. Maybe it's in your head. So the real big sceptical problem is once you accept there is this veil of perception and everything is indirect and we can't directly perceive it, then then you can't confirm that what you perceive is coming from a reality. And then if, if you can do that ever, you've then got the problem of, OK, we know there's a reality that's causing it. But do I actually know that, that what I'm perceiving actually resembles that reality? Because it's possible, like I said, with my 7000 foot wide computer, that it just represents it, but it's not like it is so you know the, the usual analogy is something like a map a map represents a great space but it's not at all the same as it so if i have a, a map of the lake district i can hold it in my hands it's flat um, but if i'm in the lake district it's miles and miles it's mountains it's completely different but the map's like a good representation of what is there so it's accurate to an extent but it's not the same thing at all. And if I thought that that was what the Lake District was, I'd be very surprised when I drive up to the Lake District. So it could be that there is a real world, but what I see um, just represents that world in some way that understands. And maybe in reality, we're not people like we think we are. Maybe we're just like blurry shapes of stuff being sent out into the world, just like a weird bunch of light and sound and there's no physical bodies at all and that's the truth of who we are and we will never see it and we'll never know so there's all these skeptical problems great so yes in fact uh, i mean the way what we're doing is here and in certainly the aqa specification and and elsewhere certainly you know if you go to university and study philosophy then this is a kind of basically a kind of standard story reflecting a big part of kind of early modern uh, narrative of, of what, what things are about and I always think that you know we start with direct realism and then we have to make some moves and to accommodate you know particular problems and then we're thinking about our senses but the more we introduce an intermediary the more then we're introducing skepticism because we were supposed to be perceiving the world and now we're not perceiving the world we're perceiving something else and we get all these doubts that you've just articulated Dan. Michael, anything to add? And then we'll see if we can examine how some people try to rescue indirect realism. Only the, the example I use tends to be virtual reality. And Dan's introduced these different ideas. So um, there could be lots of ways the world is. Here's one way the world could be. It's a big computer. And all that exists is me and the computer. And the computer feeds me all of this information. Um, there are some people, Elon Musk being among them, who think that's actually quite probably the truth. Which is which is scary, um, but there we go. So it, it's it, it is precisely this idea that there is something out. You know, there's a cause. Perhaps there's some kind of cause, and we'll get into that in just a second. Perhaps uh, you know something is is causing me. So maybe you know, it's not hallucination. But even if it's not hallucination, how do I know that there is anything out there which is anything like a set of physical objects? Yeah, as I experience them. Yeah, good. So let's go straight into that because we're thinking about not just perceptions but perceptual knowledge of a world, a world of stuff. And as we say, that's that's the problem we're sceptical about. So yeah, how have some, Michael, do you perhaps, because you just introduced it, do you want to explain how some people have tried to fix it then? There's a couple of, there's a couple of ways which we can kind of put together, because I think the second is really a development of the first. So the first is to rule out the hallucination point um, and to say, look, um, how do we if we've we've got sense data, and as as Dan says, I can't really figure out 
what is actually there, like with the painting. I've got the painting, but I can't compare my painting with the cause of my painting, the origin of my painting, whether it's personal or something like that. So we've got different hypotheses. So Bertrand Russell says, well, you've got different hypotheses. You certainly see things. And what are your possible explanations? Well, one is that they just occur. Okay, well, let's even go back further. Let's go, go to, to, to Locke's kind of first discussion. He said, well, maybe you're hallucinating it. And Locke says, no, of course you're not hallucinating it. It's involuntary. So he says, look, compare, if you close your eyes and imagine seeing a sunny day, you can choose to imagine seeing a sunny day or not seeing a sunny day. And you can just choose. You can control that. If you open your eyes and it really is a sunny day, good luck <laughs> managing to bring on the perceptual experience of heavy rain, right? No, I'm paraphrasing. Okay, so you, you don't have a choice when you're perceiving as to what it is that you perceive. But in imagination, at least, you do have that choice. So the kind of, the, the default position is to say, I am not making this up. Because if I was making it up, as you said, I would make up a much more exciting hallucination than this one. All right, so we would, then we go, okay, so it, you've got to be coming from outside you. So you, the explanation is coming from inside you seems a bit pants. The idea that there's no explanation, sense data are just bubbling into existence. Well, that's, that's not how philosophy or science or anything works. You know, we have an experience, we go, ooh, we get really curious about it. How did that happen? And if somebody says, no, we don't know, it's like you shut down the conversation <laughs> before you've even tried. So what's the other explanation, Russell says? So one explanation is it just happens. What's the other one? Here's the other one. There really is a world of physical objects, and it looks a lot like, you know, what we can see and stuff is happening in it, just like we see. So you've got these two possibilities. What's your money on? Is it on, we have no explanation of sense data, or is it on, there's a world and it looks roughly like what we see it, it does in some kind of a way. Clearly, the hypothesis that there is a physical world and it is the cause of our sense data, and at least it, there's some form of representation, is a better hypothesis than the hypothesis that there is no explanation at all of what's going on. So it's not a proof. He accepts it. You can't kind of prove it. But a lot of what we do, which we accept as scientific knowledge or knowledge in everyday, it's not about proof. It's about beyond reasonable doubt. It's about gathering a really good argument. So he says that's the best hypothesis for that. And Locke adds a really lovely example to, to support that. So there's one way of making it the best hypothesis. Let's add some more evidence. If you take two senses, it turns out that the information between them is, is likely coordinated. You look at a fire, you pop your hand in the fire, surprise, surprise, so things that look like that feel like this. Ow! Why? Right? Because because your sense of touch and the sense of vision are completely different senses, but they're providing you with this repeatedly coordinated information. You can anticipate this. So Trotter Coburn, in her, in her piece on this, says, well, you know, if you see an object, you can imagine what it sounds like, perhaps from past experience or something like that. But how did you connect vision and sound? So I see a dog. And I'd be very surprised if it squeaks or meows or, you know, it's going to bark. And I can anticipate that. I see a train and then the train whistle goes and I'm not at all surprised. And if it's a car horn, I am surprised. So I've got these anticipations. And of course, that's repeatedly confirmed. So we set this up in some kind of a way. Well, the simplest explanation is that there is a physical object which emits this sound and looks like this or looks like this and feels like this because there is this thing. So this kind of coherence of our senses that one sense can confirm that the other sense shows again, A, that it's coming from outside our minds, but B, there's a thing there with a set of properties which we can perceive through different senses, and they are constant, you know, that we repeatedly have this experience, and they are constantly in conjunction, these properties with each other. And that kind of is a really good kind of additional bit of evidence um, to suggest that there are physical objects. Otherwise, why every time I see a dog will I hear a bark? Or why every time when I see a fire and I put my hand towards it will I feel heat? If it was just a matter of hallucination. So the specific perceptual experiences that we have are coordinated in a way which a physical world, the existence of a physical world, is the best explanation of it. Great, really helpful. Uh, anything else we want to add to indirect realism? I just was going to say it's important, I guess, for students to think when you are defending or criticizing 
uh, to remember those two different scepticisms, the scepticism of the real world causing the information and then the scepticism about what you perceive being what the real world is actually like or not. So the best hypothesis is saying, yeah, that, that it does seem like there is this mind independent reality that is causing all of these perceptions and there's loads of good reasons for that. And there's the clearance of the senses that seems to say that. But the primary qualities thing is something you can also bring in to say, and some of what we see, I think we've got good reason. Again, best hypothesis can't necessarily prove it, but good reason to say if there is a real world causing this, this thing seems to be actually what the thing is like. And you can build on that that basic idea with a, another coherence of the senses kind of argument that sort of just points about the idea that there does seem to be, you know, reality. Um, matches up with all these different ways so like a chair I'm sitting in a chair right now and I can fit in the chair the way my size and the chair size seem to work in such a way that I don't sit down where I think there's a space and suddenly I'm brushing up against something else because it's actually a different shape than my body is in in my perception of it you know I cross the road when a car is coming and I get hit by the car I see the car a good distance away I don't get hit by it and that seems to correlate quite regularly that that the perception of things sort of like a child's toy where you slot shapes into holes and things it seems to work and and we survive in a world where what we are perceiving if we've established it's caused by reality there does seem to be a coherence of the resemblance of of it so whether it's a representation or resemblance what's important is it seems to be to scale in some way so that even if in reality um, we're all this completely different thing and we've just represented it in this different way for perceptual purposes everything seems to be represented in the same way so we can still interact with it and work with it and 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 things go on giving us good reason to say whatever reality might be this seems to be a pretty good semblance of reality again can't prove it because i can never check the painting against the reality but you know so far every time i've tried to drink my drink it's gone into my mouth and hasn't fallen on the floor so it seems like there is a correspondence there as well okay great so let's leave the discussion there of indirect realism and then we'll see you in the next part where we're going to continue the story and think about idealism Okay, welcome back. Uh, so we've just been talking about indirect realism, and it seemed to ended on a quite a positive note, right? Um, but there's another big part of the standard story, and that's idealism, uh, particularly as developed by George Barclay. And it kind of follows on from where we were just leaving things there. So, Michael, do you want to carry on the story for us? Sure. So the way in which indirect realism avoids supposedly avoids scepticism about the world is to say, well, the best explanation that we've got of our sense data is that there's a physical world that these sense data resemble um, and which is the cause of the sense data. And I think the main thrust of Barclay's argument is there's a better explanation. That's not the best explanation at all. In fact, it's just going to suffer the problem of scepticism. It's going to suffer a kind of insoluble scepticism in the end. So a way of, un- of, kind of approaching Barclay is, is to sort of try and see why he thinks that that's actually not the best explanation. Now, what he offers sounds bizarrely worse when you first hear it. Everyone reads Barclay's and says, what was he on? So Barclay's view is there are no physical objects. And I'm not quite sure. That wasn't that the first thing that Russell said was clearly the worst option. There are just these sense data. Um, and, and he goes, well, 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 you know, give it time and take a whole book. All right. That's the kind of time it needs. Um, but I now persuade you. So we made the primary secondary quality distinctions. Here's a kind of first move in this. Let's say primary secondary quality distinction. We said, okay, so the primary qualities are the ones which are there. They're part of the physical objects. And then the secondary qualities are in our minds. And Barclay goes, well, why do you think that? Well, you know, because it looks like different colors for different perceptual systems or, you know, whatever it is, we get these contrast effects and so on. And he goes, yeah, that happens with the with the primary qualities, too, because wasn't one of our first examples of perceptual variation that, you know, things can look a different shape to different people. So you want to say that the table really is a rectangle, even though you see it as an oblong and you see it a trapezoid and you see it with angles like this. But the table has this real shape. 
why do you say it has a real shape any more than it has a real color? Um, what about motion? Well, to some extent, motion is is relative, as Einstein showed as well. But Berkeley was kind of going, well, that most, the, the motion of something in particular, the way you would describe it would be relative to the speed at which your, your mind works. And, and small beings, which to us go nyun, 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 like house flies that you can never catch unless you're some kind of karate expert or something like that. Right, they're moving in this zigzaggy way. They're probably meandering slowly through the air. And where do you see these weird lumbering elephants? Okay, so the motion takes these different qualities depending on perception of time, for instance, and so on and so on. So he says, I don't see a distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Um, I don't see how you can kind of say, well, there's the, ob- the qualities of the object and then the qualities of the perception. And then he... I think is a, he, he pushes this a bit further. So he says, okay, so tell me this then. You're saying that the table is square, has the property of being square. So what's the table itself, right? You could get rid of the squareness and we get rid of the color. Okay, so we say the color is not really colored. Okay, but it is square. But what is the table? And you can say, well, it's this solid object. No, sorry, solid is a perceptual quality. I can feel the solidness of it. And you say, well, okay, you know, it's, it's kind of this long. No, I'm sorry, that's something I can, I can see. And what's the table itself independent of all the qualities that I perceive? What is matter? And even Locke said, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, actually, <laughs> more formally. But that is Locke's answer. I don't know. So Barclay goes, well, what you're telling me is you can see the size of the table, but not the table, and the shape of the table, but not the table, and the color of the table, but not the table. Why don't we just get rid of the table and just say you have a scent, a bundle of qualities that you perceive? And just as the secondary qualities seemed like they varied with different people or different perceptual systems, I've argued the primary qualities one offer also vary. So they're in the mind as well. So all you perceive is a bunch of qualities in the mind. You've got no reason to think there's a table. I have to make this out to be the better explanation in book. Can you come back to me on that one? That's his kind of first argument. His attack on physical substance is you have no reason from your perception to think that anything exists outside the perception itself. And you have every reason to think that the perception exists only in your mind. Great. That's a really clear explanation, Michael. In fact, I I, I was almost sitting here kind of believing it and agreeing with it. Dan, anything to, to add? Well, just that it is quite believable. I mean, what I like about Barclay is it does, like Michael said, it sounds like something that you, you hear and go, we can't all just be ideas. This is this is nonsense, obviously, because as I've been saying all along, realism is how we've stayed alive. Everything does seem to, to point towards some sort of understanding that the way I perceive the world is the way it is. And what I really like about Berkeley is, is he's an empiricist, just like Locke is, and they're both coming at this epistemologically from the idea that we get to know things about the world by experiencing what we experience. You know, we, 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 we experience the world and we ascertain what we can know from that. And Locke says, I look at the world and I can see these things and know certain things about primary second qualities. And Berkeley says, no, no, you can't. I, I look at the world and, as Michael has been saying, all I'm seeing is mind dependent qualities and properties and the secondary qualities and the primary qualities collapse into this this same thing and the fact that he's coming to that position from the same position of what do you see when you observe the world and he has this quite reasonable story about it that says actually yeah there is nothing left once you get rid of all of these different perceptual things that are differently perceived by different perceivers and there isn't like a sort of standard this is what it is um and then he then he builds it even even further to what is known as his sort of master argument um where he says well we established that i've collapsed the primary and secondary qualities right so let's go further and say there is nothing other than that which we perceive right um and he the, the sort of master argument is this challenge where he says you know Can you tell me anything? Can you conceive of anything that isn't perceived, essentially? And the the argument bit of the challenge is say, well, if you can't, and I don't think you can, nothing, everything that you've given me so far can be broken down to one of these things. 
as we've agreed that there is no such thing as a primary quality, everything becomes a mind-dependent secondary quality that is perceived. If everything that exists is perceived and everything that's perceived is mind-dependent, then everything is mind-dependent. There is nothing left in the world other than our minds. So he starts with this same position as, as Locke, undermines Locke's argument, and then quite reasonably, with a pretty solid argument, gets to a conclusion where you're left with nothing but ideas. It does seem very believable and, uh, and and dangerously compelling. Yeah. So what do we think about that master argument then? Uh, is it any good? I think Dan's interpretation is, is, is a really nice one. Can you conceive of something which cannot be, which is not perceived? And, you know, the, the example is, oh, I can imagine something which, you know, on seeing, <laughs> that's kind of the, the idea. And I think there's a stronger and a weaker interpretation. And Dan is giving us this, the, potentially the, the, the stronger one. I could imagine, for instance, Barclay says, I can imagine a tree in a field that no one sees. And he says, no, you can't. <laughs> what you're imagining is the tree. So it's an imagined tree that you're imagining. <laughs> but I think on Dan, even on Dan's interpretation, if you're imagining the tree standing in the field unperceived, you're imagining someone perceiving it because presumably you're imagining it with the perceptual qualities that you think it would have if you perceived it. So you're only imagining it under the condition of being perceived. You're not imagining what the tree itself would be like unperceived. You're not imagining an unperceived tree. You're imagining a perceived tree. That's not bad. I think it's a mistake. <laughs> OK, <laughs> but but it's 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 it was well, certainly an honest mistake in his case. So I don't think it quite works because. As Dan says, it does depend on everything that he's said so far being right. So in a sense, it's a master argument, but it's a master argument which is like the icing on the cake, which we also say that's the mastery of the cake, but with no cake, <laughs> the icing collapses. So I think if we, can, if we can refuse to accept that all we perceive are the qualities and that the qualities are secondary qualities, then the master argument doesn't take us any further. Yeah, I think that's that's right. So listen, should we also uh, bring something uh, else in or someone else in? Because they're pretty important in Barclay. So, so what's the role of God in Barclay's idealism? I mean, God God solves all his problems, essentially, because we, we've been very generous to Barclay right now. And we've said there might be problems with the argument, but we, we've started off by saying let's it seems quite compelling. So if it does work, OK, everything's an idea. Well, this podcast recording and our audience listening is a problem, because if I am just perceiving mind dependent ideas, then that's my mind, not your mind. Um, not not either of your minds or the audience listening to us right now's mind. Yet we're all in the same sort of Zoom meeting talking to each other right now, and they're listening to what we've recorded. And we got here by saying, well, let's meet at a particular time and, and do it. And we all from our various places seem to be at the same time in the same place, albeit virtually. Um, but that doesn't kind of make sense because I... I'm stuck in my world of ideas. You're stuck in your world of ideas. Michael's stuck in his world of ideas. The, the audience listening right now are stuck in their own world of ideas. And it doesn't seem obvious how we're all sharing those ideas. There's also the problem that this whole time I've been talking to you, I have a cat um, and the cat's been locked out of the room while I've been talking. And um, when I leave here, I, I assume the cat is still there and has been there the whole time. And it's food has vanished from the bowl in a way that suggests it's eaten some food while I haven't been perceiving it. Um, now, the cat maybe has been perceiving itself, but in my world of perceptions, which is the only world I've got and I'm stuck in, I didn't see the cat. And do I know that it still existed when I wasn't there? And, you know, does my wife really exist right now? She's at work. Is she? I don't know. She left the house and I'm not <laughs> perceiving her anymore. So there's this question of certain things continuing to exist without necessarily me perceiving them anymore then there's the question of the mutual world because when i said goodbye to my wife did i or did i say goodbye to the perception of my wife that i have in my head and if my wife even exists she's stuck in her world of ideas saying goodbye to a husband that exists in her mind but we've never actually met um in the same world so there's a real problem with these sorts of things and ultimately what Berkeley does is says, you're right, that that is a problem. You know, it is a problem that if no one is perceiving a tree right now, 
um, that tree might pop out of existence until one of us pop along and see it again. That is a problem. And the fact it's a problem and seems to violate everything we know empirically about the world as we perceive it, that things seem to persist when they're not being perceived by us, at least. Um, and everything that exists has to be perceived. That tension, he resolves by saying, so there must be someone perceiving it all the time. Uh, there must be some sort of grand perceiver. Um God is there watching everything, seeing everything, perceiving everything, and things are being sustained and maintained by God's perception. And maybe even things are sharing a world because they are ideas. We've still only got ideas, but they're ideas in the mind of God. So we do sort of share in some way in a reality, which is still just ideas, but it's a it's a reality of God's ideas. So God sort of solves all of his problems. Um but I think what he's trying to do is actually say not that God is there as like a rabbit out of the hat to solve all of his problems, but that all of the problems of idealism that we instinctively feel suggest to him this further proof of what do we know about the world? Well, we know there's no such thing as material stuff, but there is a God. And it actually works as a proof of the existence of God in a way. His argument for idealism um, gets to God not to solve his problems, but God is a necessary response to all the problems that seem to be from the theory which is logical and not matching with our experiences so how do we explain it well why does that stuff not happen because there must be this god so now we know there is a god because things don't pop out of existence and in and out of existence so god is kind of used in barclay's mind quite legitimately as an answer to problems that must necessarily be the answer because we don't have those problems yeah, good. So just just picking up on those last few thoughts, Dan. I mean, I always think, you know, when I when I've read Barclay, when I'm teaching Barclay, that it's a it, it isn't a kind of it's an argument for the existence of God. It's like an inference to the best explanation argument for the existence of God, right? Which is the phrase that philosophers often use: inference to the best explanation. Um, so, well, I'm I'm sitting here convinced, Michael. What do you think? No, I think I think Barclay's brilliant. I mean, that's the thing. When we get we go back to the the, the problem of skepticism that the that the poor old internal um, indirect realist had was, you know, well, what's the best explanation? And and Russell says, well, these things are just kind of popping into existence, or there's a world of physical objects that's causing them. Well, he's missed an option, <laughs> says Barclay. I've given you really good reasons to think there are no such things as physical objects, but I but obviously there are minds, <laughs> right? I have one. So I know minds can exist and I know perceptions and ideas can exist. So if I'm not the cause of my, I'm not hallucinating the world, which is unlikely he believes that Locke is right. I'm, what I perceive is involuntary. So it's coming from outside my mind. And there can't be such things as physical objects. And we've, uh, we've got no empirical you know, evidence for them. But I do know that minds exist. The most likely explanation is that some other mind is causing my mind to perceive what it does. And Barclay says, well, what kind of mind would it be that could create something on this scale? Nature is the inspiration for the artists that we know, but this is the creator of that inspiration. It's going to have to be divine. So it's exactly that. It's like, oh, Russell should have said there are three options, right? It's just there's no explanation. There are physical objects or there's God. And all Barclay is doing is saying, I've got reason to think there aren't physical objects. So by elimination, it's God. Of course, you can reverse that, and people would. Namely, I've got reason to think there's no God. See the metaphysics of God module. <laughs> so it's got to be physical objects. But it's this idea of what is the better explanation to introduce another being of a kind we know that exists, a mind, which is God, or a new kind of thing that exists, a physical object. What's the better explanation? And that's where Barclay obviously comes down on the side of of God and Russell comes down on the side of physical objects. I was just say, yeah, I mean, I always tell students that I think if you're going to critique Barclay, you need to do it before he gets to God. So once you've got to God, um, it's too late with Barclay because as Michael says, it's the obvious natural conclusion to all of his argument that, that's led to that point. And so you could take that a completely different way and you could say, well, actually, no, you've got this theory up until you bring God in to solve all the problems. And you go, right, we've got all these problems. God comes along and solves them. Or this theory has all these problems. <laughs> what else would explain it without having to bring this other entity of God in? And Michael says, oh, we've got a mind, you know, so we know there's other minds. But Barclay is not replacing um, 
well, not not putting God as a mind just like ours. For, as Michael said, it's a divine mind. It's something bigger. It's something different. So he's smuggling in a lot of assumptions about God's existence and what a what sort of mind would be able to do this. So he is actually positing something he doesn't have grounds to say just because of his own mind, because the only thing he could say is there's another mind which we know other people might have minds and they're just as limited and flawed as, as his one. So you you sort of have to say, well, maybe the, the 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 theory that gets us to this point where we are trapped in this solipsistic, I'm just a mind and there needs to be God to pull me out of this hole. You need to see what went wrong there and reject the theory earlier. So something went wrong with the master argument or the collapse of the primary and secondary qualities. And or if you can, the introduction of sense data. Or the introduction of sense data. Yeah, exactly. We could should have be. resisted yeah. indirect realism. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's a genuine thing to say. One of the problems of all of this is um, a, a sort of reasonable direct realism could, without having to go as far as indirect realism, just sort of say, this is the way we perceive as human biological machines. There is, quote unquote, non-mediated mediation in terms of we receive information from objects. That's just how perception happens. But in relation to those objects, which is what Michael said right at the start, that relationship between perceiver and object, we see them, we perceive them as directly as is possible to perceive, sometimes with these problems that arise as a result of the nature of that relationship. But that's just the way the world is. And we don't need to worry about primary and secondary qualities. We don't need to worry about bringing God into it. We don't need to worry that we're all solipsists. That we are just direct realists. We see what there is, and that's why we don't die because we manage to not fall down holes that we see and avoid them and things like that. Yeah, good. So actually, that's that kind of partly answers the question I was going to come to 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 end the the episode. So Dan, earlier on, you saying you know you change your mind every time you teach this, depending on what your students say. Um, I mean, where, where do you come down on this big grand story that the two of you? Where 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 do your inclinations? Well, my, my inclination um, tends to be in indirect realism, despite me just criticising it. <laughs> um, but but an, an indirect version of direct realism as well, because I, I do sort of think I think it's untenable to say we directly perceive exactly what is there, because there are so many reasons to doubt that. You know, the the, the fact that I know that the things I'm perceiving is a construction of my brain based on data that isn't even true like i've got a blind spot that just (laughs) isn't real there's a bit of the side of my vision like all of us that is just a fabrication of my brain so i kind of know i'm not seeing reality um as as is but i do think realism is compelling and a form of indirect realism um and if it means that i therefore never see reality directly i'm not that concerned if it's impossible and that's why i would say it's a, as a direct a realism as we could ever achieve is the sort of things we are in relationship to the world. But I've, I've never really been that swayed by Berkeley. Um, it's like something like the ontological argument. It's got some lovely logical moves in it and I enjoy the journey and I get there and I go, and that's the conclusion and it's sound and it's brilliant. And then I have to think, well, why do I still not, why am I not convinced <laughs> there's got to be something, something wrong with it and go backwards. So yeah, I think Berkeley is really compelling, but I never have quite gone for, the yeah we're all just ideas so some version of direct indirect realism that leans towards indirect but i might call it a qualified direct realism okay michael what where where, where are you landing? dan and i are, are, are quite close and i would say as well i mean we should also point out with everything on the a level there are more options than you study at a level that's right absolutely. Um, and the truth may well be nowhere on the specification but I think the, the I would I would say something very similar. What I take to be the direct realists kind of primary stance against the move towards indirect realism is the introduction of sense data. That once you've introduced sense data into perception, then you're into indirect realism. And it was the introduction of that that led to problems with skepticism. So yes, we're going to have a physical story. And then we probably have to kind of get quite a lot further before we can really say, but but the physical story isn't the philosophical story of perception. And you kind of separate these two and say, what you perceive are objects and how you perceive is light and things like this. Um, and I think that would, something going down that route is is probably correct. It just becomes quite difficult to, it's difficult to maintain without a, a lot of kind of philosophical background about 
the notion of the difference between the what and the how, because as, as Dan says, one, the more you discover about the how and how the brain constructs imagery and so on, you have to kind of, you say, yep, that's still nothing to do with perception as philosophers talk about it. That's perception. as new. And it does get a bit tricky at times, but I, th- I think it's right that unless we hold on, and this is what I suppose what I want, where I want, where I think Barclay went wrong, I do perceive the table itself. I don't just perceive the qualities of the table. Unless I can give that sentence some meaning, Barclay's on for a winner, one way or another. And we either end up with idealism or skepticism or something along those lines. So I've got to say, in some real direct sense, I can perceive tables and chairs. So some version of direct realism suitably adjusted. And to bring it back to epistemology, I think like what we've both said is that's the only way we can say we know anything about the, the world as well, which is quite important. So if if in our sort of wildest moments we we dabble with the sceptical view, it is accepting that, well, then I, I can't know anything about the things I'm perceiving on a, on a very grand scale. And I think there's quite a lot of empirical evidence of even if it's all a constructed fabrication in some way, that's the world that I live in and as far as any knowledge is that's what knowledge must be for me as a being that lives in this fantasy this construction this hallucination this whatever it is so from from an epistemological perspective you could argue that whatever the theory of perception is it's got to be one that allows you to say I know if someone's at the door where to go to 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 open the door (laughs) Uh, um, or else it's it's kind of useless and as long as i can do that even if it's not a real door within my constructed world i it is a real door to me and so there's some sort of knowledge there that's that's good in fact so those last few words from you over the last minute or so put me in mind of Immanuel kant but that's a whole whole other episode everyone i don't think we're gonna talk about Kant in five minutes. Um, listen, we should leave things uh, there and say thank you to both of our guests for explaining everything for us. So thanks to you, Michael. Oh, thanks very much, Simon. That was great fun. Uh, and Dan, thanks to you for coming on as well. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Great. And thanks to you for listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed that episode and you found it useful. And all being well, we'll see you again, or perhaps we won't see you again, but you might hear us again. Who knows? Uh, on another episode of Philosophy Gets Schooled.